I'm going to have to do something about that bio, eh? <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, obviously, with things uh, happening on the international stage, uh, such as the crisis once more in the Crimea and um, the issues pertaining to Qantas, I have a feeling that we're a bit like the Grateful Dead at Woodstock. We're going to be the most unwatched thing <laughs> for today, coming on slightly between The Who and Jimi Hendrix. Um, it's, uh, it's great also to be in a room of people who are at the top of their field. I'm privileged to join you here as the Agricultural Minister, uh, as a short after um, also ha having some experience as a Shadow Minister for Water. This is the 44th ABARES Outlook confer Conference. Um, for, many it used to, for many, it was simply known as the Bureau of Agricultural Economics, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a, another example of such a long-running and well-grounded -ground, discussion across government and industry. The Department of Agriculture itself can trace its roots right back um, to our constitution in 1901 under section uh, 51, and I think you'd see subsection 51.9 and also to a, into a partial way subsection 10. So it's integral to what our nation is. We have a remarkable tradition of innovative agricultural production that stretches right back to Captain Philip. I noted when Captain Philip first arrived in 1788, he had seven horses, six cattle, 29 sheep, 12 pigs, and a few goats and fowls, as well as a number of people, some rather unhappy about where they just arrived, um, and another group rather unhappy that they had arrived. Um, in fact, Philip was woefully under-resourced. And it's a statement right at the start of uh, when Euro European settlement that uh, the Aboriginals had a good agricultural policy. They had uh, sustainable for their population. They were, uh, they were able to feed the, the, themselves over tens of thousands of years. But a new agricultural policy that wasn't adapted for the land uh, proved to be, uh, as Robert Hughes said at the very start, fatal. Um, they had the wrong equipment, they had the wrong seeds, they had the wrong genetics, they lost all their cattle. I don't know how that would have gone under the SCAS system. Um, they, they picked the wrong soils uh, and they were lacking fresh water. Uh, as stated, uh, the colony lived on the bleak edge of starvation. For the first 20 years, um, it also had to deal with floods on the Hawkesbury and there was a strong discussion uh, as to whether the whole colony was viable and whether it should be packed up and shipped back to England. Instead, what they did was prevailed and made sure that uh, they learned from their experience and, and borrowed from their environment around them and used their heads, predominantly, to work out how to advance. And of course, what we have is what you see now. Data and forecasting methodologies have been an increasingly crucial part of every agricultural business, from the very small to the very large. But outside factors, world markets, interest rate, currency plays, fair and unfair competition in other countries have also had a direct impact on the best managed and best run rural enterprises. Good policy and good government and conversely bad government also play a central role. I'm regularly, regularly criticised uh, for virtually everything for, <laughs> for um, my interventionist style in politics. Even the drought package, was, which was designed to provide farming families who have no income due to the drought some dignity and sustenance to help them ease some of the pressures from the cost of loans, which were gained, which, uh, gained bipartisan support, was pilloried for supposedly propping up unviable farmers. I do not want to be a minister to allow the cyclical and seminal nature of disasters like droughts and floods with all their associated human misery and despair to be the cruel instruments of rationalising the farm sector. Nor can you say that farming and grazing is like a shop in town and when the factors are against you, you can just shut the door and walk out. You can't. You have to manage through it. I believe farming is not an unviable sunset industry. It is a business with a future and that's why I want to support it. But the criticisms of, any, of intervention in the agricultural sector, even, even the smallest, or those with, with compassionate tensions, are often driven more by ideology. The, the, the criticisms are driven by ideology more than anything else. The truth is, and it's got to be understood, that, that at 3%, Australia has the second lowest level of support for its agricultural sector in the OECD. The OECD average farm level of support is 19%. I know this is correct because the ABC has fact-checked it. 
The only country that has a lower support than Australia is New Zealand. Now, I don't want to cause offence to our friends across the Tasman, and they are deservedly enjoying strong economic growth driven by their booming dairy sector that helped their nation grow by 1.4 per cent in the September quarter alone. Dairy company Fonterra, which owns some of Australia's best-known brands like Western Star and which markets bigger cheese and which is owned and managed by the country's dairy farmer, is a large driver of that success. Um, Fonterra would be, is, I presume, a, a Maori word that stands for dairy single desk because um, because that is effectively what it is, and good luck to them. What I'm saying is even the purists are not so pure. The Australian Financial Review's Alan Mitchell is one of the spear throwers that, aired, that has aired his views about uh, my proclamations and any form of government regulation or intervention, whatever, he believes is harmful, no matter what the circumstances. Only last weekend he used his column to criticise the drought package the Abbott government had drawn up for allegedly slowing Australia's ability to meet the food demands of Asia. It always amazes me when we have so many experts and when you go back through their CV, the one thing they all have in common is they've never actually been on the land. Um, putting aside the absurdity that's, that's giving some farming families the equivalent of new, that giving, that's giving some farming families the equivalent of new start to put food on the table will somehow prevent Australia being able to export to Asia over the coming decades, I want to make a separate point about the government's role in agriculture. And here's the irony. Most farmers I talk to would love more deregulation. In fact, they would love to completely deregulate because they know that if this happened on a large scale, the rural industry would boom. Um, they would take away the native vegetation laws, or a vast number of them, and as, as mentioned before, at the Welcome to Country, they would go back into that wheat paddock, paddock and remove those trees. Um, uh, they would take away uh, many environmental laws, they would take away many labour laws, they would introduce uh, greater competition in the labour market, uh, they would give existing owners unencumbered freehold real meaning, they would take back the rights that over generations have been taken off them in regards to hydrocarbonous materials under the land, such as coal, oil and gas, and that's just for starters. But immediately that this happened, the same critics who said that we were um, overregulated would start screaming that we were underregulated, and the community would not accept uh, a, a totally deregulated agricultural sector. So let's believe in the realisation that we, are, that we are by nature a highly regulated industry and we are regulated predominantly um, to fit the whims of, of, in some instances, an urban conscience. There are laws that are too cumbersome. In many instances, there are red and green tape. It is unnecessary. Many people, as they load cattle, will tell you that if they had to obey every occupational health and safety law that they were supposed to obey, nothing would ever get done. Um, but we have many things that we need to do. One of the uh, new uh, laws that are before us, or new regulations or reviews that are before us, is the Quarantine and Biodiversity and Security, uh, Biosecurity Act, which I intend to introduce in the coming months. This will be the biggest overhaul of this act in 100 years, but arguably there is no law more important to the future of agricultural industry because it helps protect our economic advantage. It protects our unique island continent, still green, clean, and gives us one of the greatest marketing advantages we have in the world. Research and development is another area where the government's intervention, if that's what you like to call it, has helped Australian agricultural productivity grow more strongly than the productivity of almost all other market sectors. Good and well-targeted R&D underpins the profitability and sustainability of the agricultural sector. So we are investing $100 million in additional funding for rural research and development corporations. For each dollar invested in rural and research and development, there is an estimated return to Australian agriculture and the Australian economy of around about $11 for every dollar. The effects of drought can be devastating for the best prepared businesses. When droughts break, the contribution that farmers make, however, is always vastly in excess of any support the government ever gave them. This is one of the underlying principles of the drought package and the reason why farming is different from assistance to other industries. The $320 million drought support package announced by the government last week um, has many attributes which are going to assist uh, people in the future. It allows, um, for instance, to get new start in and to give a threshold of $2.55 million, which is more applicable to where uh, farming families are. It allows people to earn up to $80,000 off farm, and this is extremely important because so many people uh, just use the money that they're earning off farm to uh, 
pay their interest bill. So as long as your interest expenses is greater than $80,000, it gives you the capacity to go away and earn some money to at least keep the, the bank at bay. It adds $12 million to the $10 million we already put forward in our first, first iteration of the drought package, uh, which I put through last year, for water infrastructure. I think very importantly, it flags an issue that uh, I've, I've tried to bring up so many times, and that is the pressure that's coming onto our agricultural sectors. I used to just think it was in the west, in Queensland, but now I'm seeing it in the east, and that's from such things as wild dogs, which is causing a real problem. And we have to try and get past the cynicism and sneering comments that so many people put out when you bring up these things that they don't see in their backyard, therefore they believe they don't exist. But they do. It deals with issues such as mental health. And I continually uh, have on my phone a range of people that I speak to uh, at night trying to make sure that um, basically they uh, don't harm themselves. And uh, this, is, this is one of, the, um, one of the, you know, the big issues that we have for people who are under the pump when they're under drought and when the banks are screaming at them. Sustainable businesses are only useful if we have access to reliable markets at the best price for our produce. A practical focus on markets for Australian produce will be the priority for this government. Since being elected late last year, the Coalition is already making important advances in market access. I'd like to commend the work that's been done on the Korean and Australian Free Trade Agreement and uh, what it will achieve for our nation. Uh, but we've got to remember that uh, we'll have to double our efforts again with the, with the Japanese one and then with the Chinese one and see how we go with the um, multilateral TPPs. We've got to realise in Australia we believe that we'll be the food basket of Asia, um, but it, we've got to actually understand where we are. Even if you look at wheat, which we see ourselves as a large producer, um, I think we're about five. I know that India produces more wheat than us, China does, US does, and France does. Um, if we look at beef, you know, well, we've got the US, Brazil, China, and Argentina. I think even in India, I think they're all larger producers than us. So it is, it is not right that we just think that because we're here, we're going to prevail. We have to be here and prevail with the best product at the right price. It's got to be quality or it won't sell. Um, so the opportunities will always uh, are there, but we're, it's a lot of work to be involved with them. Australia is well placed to, deli to deliver and establishing ourselves as a large scale specialty markets will be essential, whether in beef, cheese, vegetables or seafood. But at the same time, Australia must make sure we protect our critical national asset and supply chains. Can't afford to be complacent. One of the key international markets for Australia will be our ability to differentiate our products as the best in the world. Others will be building and improving our national infrastructure. We've got to do work on rail, air and telecommunications. Uh, the inland rail is going to be a vital piece of infrastructure for our nation, nation on the east coast. We still live in a nation today which, as perverse as it is, there are only two sealed roads that go from east to west. If you want to go from the western part of our continent to the eastern part of our continent and stay on a sealed road, you have two alternatives. And how this would be seen in China or the United States or Brazil, I don't know, but I imagine they've got more than two. Um, we, have the, we have the benefit of many world-class analysis and economists here today to assist us in the decisions of what will work for Australian agriculture. But it's not enough to continually increase productivity if we're just standing still financially and not making a buck. This is what we have to keep coming back, back to, the basics. There has to be a monetary incentive for people to go on and to stay on the land. People on the land are doing, and I keep saying it, are noble people. They are doing a moral business. They are feeding and clothing people. And they do this isolated from the benevolence of so many public funded utilities, hospitals, schools, parks, libraries, and public events that so many of us expect today. Um, there is no um, museum showing uh, the attributes of the Inca people in Borona. Um, but they do it, but when we uh, sometimes persecute them, we, we talk to them as if uh, they were, uh, that the manifestation of the, of the public dollar was as, it was, as, was as clear in their lives as it is in ours, and it's not. You don't get enthusiastic young people or new entrants to agriculture with big dreams and big ideas taking up the land of, 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 that was handed to, down to them by their parents without some reason beyond some form of romantic form of patriotism. They have to make a dollar. And this is why I've, I've 
I have made making a, re a fair return at the farm gate the key driver of our, of our department, in the Department of Agriculture. This will be also the key driver in what the White Paper will intend to, to deal with. These round tables that will occur from this white paper will be seminal in developing an agricultural policy that I hope will not just last for my tenure as the agricultural minister, be of some assistance, I hope, to the agricultural ministers that come after me. Um, I don't necessarily want a partisan document. I want a document that exists over a longer frame. I believe that agricultural policy must be in some way similar to a defence policy. It can't just change with every government. There has to be a consistency. It has to have some consistent principles that reside in it. Because only by doing that uh, do we have the capacity for people to plan. And it's only if the objective of that is to get a better return back to the farm gate that you will attract uh, new Australians and young Australians into the industry that we, want to, that we want to survive. And it has to survive for the benefit of our nation. I think one of the advantages of agriculture is this, that if we, we can see the struggles that we're having in the manufacturing industry, they're self-evident. And now even in the service industry, and we can see the discussions that are around Qantas at the moment. We also got to remember in the service industry, if you're talking about insurance policies or something that's done at a keyboard, that our competition is merely one key stroke away. One key stroke away in another country with a lower wage rate with the, the absolute capacity to do the, the job we expect them to do. And so, so you really start looking at where does our strategic advantage in our nation lie? Well, it lies in mining, because you're, God's either endowed you with little black rocks and little red rocks called coal and iron ore, or he hasn't. And if he hasn't, you can't make it up. The other thing is large-scale agriculture. We can do that. We can do that. And delivering a quality product, we can do that. Um, but we've got to be smart enough to do it well. So we've got to think big, and we've got to think big at how we approach things. Growing up, my family gathered around our dining table for Sunday lunch. At that table, we talked about many things that affected our farm. We talked about the many things that affected our lives. And a lot of them were driven by politics. They were driven by whether the railway line worked efficiently, whether the ports were working efficiently, whether the economy was working efficiently, whether interest rates were beyond our capacity to repay. They were, they were predominantly our biggest risk so many times was not so much the weather. Um, unfortunately, it could be our government, and we've got to make sure our government is not the biggest risk to agriculture. Um, now the white paper process gives us the capacity to all be part of it, and ABES will be absolutely crucial in making sure that we have stringent and well-researched backing to that document. So more than ever, this conference has a role to play, and I'll be extremely interested in some of the deliberations that come from this room. Uh, farming produces about $50 billion in gross value every year. Uh, the sector employs 278,000 people directly and another quarter of a million people roughly indirectly. Um, if you look at the manufacturing, if you look at food processing, it's a vastly bigger employer than the motor vehicle industry. Um, just Walk into an abattoir and see how many people you see working there. It has a great future. What I hope is that as we go forward, that we can produce a document, and I really want to frame this ABES conference around the white paper, that the work that happens over this conference in the next few days is seminal and, and, um, and can give some sort of instruction into how we can create in that document something that we'll all be proud of. Uh, that we can all stand behind and say, well, uh, this is a document, this white paper is something that has is been delivered by some of the best minds and the best experience to give our nation the best future, uh, to take the people that to give our economy the best hope of getting the best return from one of our best assets. All the best and God bless.